Before we get started with today's show, I want to tell you about another great ESPN podcast, 30 for 30 podcast. 30 for 30 is back with season eight. Heavy Metals Inside the Caroli Gymnastics Empire is a groundbreaking seven-part podcast series that takes listeners on a deep dive into the lives and influence of Bella and Martha Caroli, the most successful and controversial coaches in USA Gymnastics history. To listen to the trailer, subscribe now to the 30 for 30 feed. The whole season drops next Tuesday, July 14th. Be sure to check it out. You can download and subscribe to 30 for 30 podcasts as well as the right time wherever you get your podcasts. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening wherever you get your podcast. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe that you are a hater. Uh, it is that time of week where we get our interview on. And joining us, he is the author of The Heritage, the author of Full Dissident. Be sure to check those books out. Also, ESPN The Magazine. I guess since you work here, we should mention that you work here. And right now, it's always fun to see everybody's different setup because we do this on, you know, an equivalent of Zoom where you can see everybody. Howard over there with the headphones and the microphone attached to it, looking like I'm going to try to get a number four super size. <laughs> Howard Brian, what's going on? I'm good. I'm sitting in. The, I don't usually do this from here. I usually do this, um, you know, over by my bookcase. But since we wanted to do it off a laptop, all right, this is where I write. I'm, I'm busted. I'm in bed. Sitting here, I got the bed with the adjustable base, so I'm like reclined, like I'm in a hospital bed. It's vibrating. We straight, we good. I I, I got to tell you though, bedrooms make the sound better because all the stuff around absorbs all the waves. That's right. They go softer. Uh, <laughs> it works out that way. And so we have not talked in a while. The world has been everything that's happened. We haven't talked about here in a while, but the world has been everything that has happened here. But the thing that strikes me about this, whether it be the Washington football team, we can come with a couple other examples. The Mississippi State flag, I think, is one. We are seeing things that for a while we thought may never change, change. But the most interesting part is you notice that the money seems to be getting out in front of making some of these changes before people make them. You're right. What has been surprising about all of this is when you start looking at the why. And we've been talking about this for the last couple of months. Why is this happening? Why now? Why now? Why now? You also know that the corporations are making sure that they look like they're being proactive. See, I also feel like and where I think this gets interesting is that I think it's easy to look at George Floyd as a catalyst for a lot of things. And I think it has been a catalyst for a lot of things. But it's feeling like in some different directions that some of these decisions had kind of sort of already been made. Like for what is happening with the Washington football team, for example, somebody had been planning to do something like this for a while. Like it seems like they had some toes out on that, though. The money end of it, Fred Smith, like all these people, they seem to have some toes out on this already. Like, and I'm wondering, and I've talked about this a little bit on the show before, that in the beginning of the Trump administration, people viewed that as, oh, we have a new president. And they tried to get in line with what they thought the new world order was. And then they figured out pretty quick, this isn't going to be the new world order. This isn't what it's going to be. And I'm wondering how many people looked up and realized that in the name of legacy, they were going to need to kind of rewind and re-record. Yeah, I've been thinking this for a long time, that especially this year, 2020, obviously, when you start adding the pandemic to it as well, is this idea that everyone's been saying, okay, well, why is the NFL changing and what's going on and what's happening? And, you know, obviously when you look at what happened with George Floyd, enough was enough. And I'm like, I don't see it that way. I'm like, I didn't see anything that happened to George Floyd that didn't happen to Eric Garner. I didn't see anything that happened to George Floyd that didn't happen to Laquan McDonald or, or Sandra Bland. Obviously it affected people in a way that those didn't because you never know which match is going to strike. But at the same time, what I always felt was that this was a slow repudiation or almost or an, maybe even an immediate repudiation of what was happening in the White House that you people have been saying for a long time now on the political side. When is the power going to abandon him? You know, people are always asking about whether or not there, it was going to be the Republican Party that was going to back away from him or how was it going to look? And I think what you're seeing, especially in the NFL, which ran scared of him for the first two years, this is maybe their sign that he's vulnerable and we don't want to be signed on. We don't want to be signed on to this historically. So the corporations in a lot of ways are boxing him in in a lot of ways because they are repudiating his policies. And so when you're looking at FedEx getting involved, 
when you look at the Mississippi state flag and you're looking at all these different things that seem tangentially related to what's happening at the White House, a lot of ways what you're seeing is you're seeing the corporations tell the public that this is the direction we want the popular culture and that we want the society to go in. It's not as though FedEx just now realized that the Washington logo was racist. I think they're sort of like, okay, this is bad. We need to be out in front of it when people are actually pulling down monuments. I mean, that's some CNN international stuff. You don't see that in the United States where people decide to physically go outside and tear monuments down. I think that a lot of these American corporations are recognizing that it's only a matter of time before they start looking at our connections and we want to be on the right side of this. You know, it's funny you mentioned that thing about people not hitting the streets in the United States. My buddy Spencer Hall always makes this point. Like, the French must be scoffing at us, right? The, <laughs> exactly. French, the French hit the street. It don't take nothing for nothing. the French to get in the street. We talk about how soft the French are and everything else. They strike and every week. Fr French would have been in the street well before this went down. Last time I was in France, there was a wildcat strike on the taxis. Nobody could get from the airport into the city. <laughs> they like they they all they always, always ready mm -hmm. for what this is and so like, i don't know if you saw this larry hogan uh the governor of maryland he's running maryland, for the election sure. mm -hmm. and they asked him about the washington football team name this week and his response was that i think now is the time for the name to change and i'm like so where was the person to ask the question why wasn't it the time before that's right? right like that's what i want somebody to tell me when they're like all of these things like now is the time for us to do it well why wasn't it the time before Exactly. And I think that's one of the questions my sister and I were talking about this the other day is, is why now a productive conversation? Is it more productive to say now that now is the time, let's take full advantage of the time? I think why now is an extremely relevant and important conversation to have because you're still asking yourself the question. And I think that you need to have an understanding that all of the actors involved here have been here before. They're not, it's not like there was some re-election and we brought in this new wave of people and they brought in with them a new orthodoxy. All these people have already been in place. Yep, it's all there, right? Like, so this is, and I think the reason I think why now is an important question is because this isn't necessarily a permanent condition that we're under right now. So right. if this was the time to take them down, then we need to identify what made the time right to put them up in the first place. Like, this, like I, I've contended that, like, it's kind of a truth and reconciliation concept, right? Like, this isn't going to work unless people give some real acknowledgement as to how it was that we got here in the first place. And you don't have to answer for your ancestors. They got enough stuff to answer for themselves as right. to where it was and how it was that we got here. But I just looked around at all of these. I was so stunned. Um, We saw the players at the University of Texas put out a list of demands, for example, is what they expected right. from the program there. We haven't heard any real backlash against them. <laughs> Whatever you want, guys. Thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I mean, It is the wildest thing. You and I have probably talked twice a week on the phone and had some point where we were just effectively looking at each other like, Got no what answer. is happening here? <laughs> Got no answer. Yeah, and, and you know what it is, too, is that my personal philosophy on this is when you start messing with the money, the money has to respond. You talk about the French getting, you know, and how – there, there are all kinds of different groups of people and cultures that immediately hit the streets. The United States is not one of them. Now the United States is in the street. And when you start thinking about what are the actual implications, the long-term implications, the short-term implications, the optic implications of seeing Americans Black, white, Latino, Asian in 20, 30, 40 cities across the country all mobilizing and doing something. If, you, if you're McDonald's and Nike and FedEx, you're like, we're next. We need to keep order. And this is the way to keep order is to make it seem like we're on the right side of these issues, even though we weren't before. And so I think when you see a change, and this is something that you and I talk about, and it's also something that I think we need as, as journalists to be very cognizant of is as we continue to give the athletes all this credit and we talk about them using the power of their platform, I am so sick of the word platform. And as we do this, let's also not forget that all of this happens because the people are in the streets. This ain't Jay-Z making his concierge call to the governor of, of, <laughs> of Minnesota. This is you got 200, 300,000 people. You've got 1,000 people gatherings in, in all of these different places. And you start to realize, look, I don't know how you felt about this, Bo, but to me, you look at that and you go, this country's coming apart, right? 
And if this country's coming apart, who's going to be the responsible one? You're not necessarily getting it. Well, you're not getting it at all from government leadership. So it appears to me that these corporations are trying to triangulate this. That's what it seems like to me, because when you start adding this perfect storm, COVID, Minneapolis, then the fact that we're in an election year anyway, you've got a perfect storm of all kinds of things that can really undermine and take down a society. And everyone always talks about with the United States, oh, it could never happen here. It could never happen here. Well, maybe not. You brought up a point when we were on the phone. I think it was last week when you were talking about this generation. And he said something along the lines of, we had to swallow a lot. We had to eat a lot because this is what happens when you come up generationally. But we also came up with the idea that whatever trash you had to eat to get into these businesses and to have a life and have a career, that there was a payoff. This generation, all they're seeing is fewer jobs, more debt, more contraction, less value in terms of what they think their values are. And if you combine all these things together, if you're running this country, you probably see something you haven't seen in 50, 55 years. Yeah. And it's happening in an election year, which I think is an important thing to point out when we talk about like government response, because you've seen this from Trump. Trump is doubling down on the far right stuff on this. Right. Like he's yeah. doubling, like I think he just did some interview where he said, you know, he saw the Confederate flag and waved the Confederate flag as a free speech issue. Like he's going all the way in that direction on this and the corporate. And it's funny because the money has said, no, no we're not exactly. going to do that. And people need to understand generally the country is really run by the <laughs> high levels of the money. That's right. You're about to find out who actually runs this country. Yeah. Like, there's a book called Confessions of an Economic Hitman, which is really interesting about a guy who did a work for the World Bank and IMF. And he explains everything that goes on there. But the first thing that he mentions there is that the people that run this are the big time money. And so it's fascinating that the big time money, which is capitulated to the whims of like a population of races that isn't even necessarily the majority of whiteness, let alone the majority of the country, and has just suddenly decided, nope, we're not going to do that. And Trump is like, but that's how I'm going to get elected. <laughs> that's you know? how I got elected. Yeah. But for whatever reason, Trump has decided that his play, which is a very rare play in presidential politics, is not to come to the center. Yeah, It's to go all the way to the side. That's what he thinks is going to get it done right now. Because, I mean, I understand that, too, because going to the center probably isn't going to work. So they're going. he's going all the way in one direction. And corporate culture, while this is a ruthlessly capitalist era, which is in line with what people would contend to be right-wing beliefs, the liberals won the corporate culture war. Like, right. what the image of a corporation is, the liberals have won. And now we're seeing that come in conflict with the will of the man that is in charge here. And oh, by the way, we got four more months before they vote on anything. Well, and, and you know, you bring up an interesting point on this, too, because the other part that I was thinking of the other day, I was talking to a friend of mine and I was like, you know what, folks, as we talk about all of this, there's another question that we haven't asked. And maybe we haven't asked it because we don't want to ask it or because it's not important to ask it, I think it's very important to ask it. What if he wins? It's a great question. So all this pivot, do you pivot back? Or do you just keep going because second term presidents are lame duck presidents? What if he wins? Take the NFL, for example. There's no explanation to me, and maybe you've got one I'm interested in hearing. There's no explanation to me that that puts Roger Goodell in the, not the owners, Roger Goodell, because we haven't heard from the owners but that puts Roger Goodell in a position where he's apologizing to players, where he's saying, we hear you. There has not been a corporation in America more unambiguous about how it has felt about kneeling and how it has felt about protest than the NFL. The only explanation for me that I can think of is that they recognize that the guy who gave them the most grief about kneeling, the president of the United States, can't hurt them anymore. But what if he wins? Now what happens? Does everybody who pivoted in this direction, do they pivot back or have they decided? I was talking to my aunt about this and she's like, this all has to stop. It's all gone too far. And when you talk about the center holding and the corporations controlling the money and everything else, that there are so many different elements where it's gone way too far that it has to stop. And that's really what you're seeing. You're seeing the corporations and you're seeing these different leaders recognizing that, you know what? This was just a bad idea. 
Yeah, but here's the thing. If he wins, what people feel, right? Like the popular opinion, because this seems to be what the corporations are working off of is what the people are doing rather That's than right. what the government does. The people are going to be more fervent in the opposite direction of the president of the United States. That's right. If he wins again. And I'm not exactly sure what the math is going to have to be. No uh, idea. Him, You're him, talking about having it. no feel for this. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, if you would have asked me the last time, I'd have had a thought about him not winning. And obviously that did not happen. But like, if he does win, it will be interesting to see how this plays out and how everybody does this. Because I think that right now, maintaining order is more difficult than ever. And nothing is worse for business than disorder. Exactly right. Which is why you're seeing them do what they're doing. Right. Like uncertainty. Like nothing is worse for business than those things. And it's wild because if he wins, it becomes everything becomes more uncertain than one could ever expect. Like it's wild the idea that an incumbent president winning would like lead to even more uncertainty and more disorder. And then we have sports in the middle of it where you think there's going to be sports in the fall of 2020. No, I don't. I mean, by November 3rd? Or just generally speaking, like, I don't know if there's even going to be any sports. No, I'm not sure there's going to be sports this summer. So, I mean, you saw what happened. Was it UNC who just shut their program yep. down? Yep. You had 37 positive tests. I mean, the number of different areas. I mean, this is almost like in a lot of ways, what's happening now is almost like fighting a world war. You've got so many different fronts that you're trying to figure out. You got to figure out the COVID front. You got to figure out the race front. You got to figure out the fact that who knows if there's even going to be conventions in either party this summer. There's so many different elements to this. You've got to figure out all of these different things that are taking place all at the same time. I can't see. I mean, I think they're going to start. I think that the NBA has decided, look, we going. I think baseball has said, OK, on July 23rd, we're going. We're not sure how long it's going to last, but we're going. I don't know about football because I don't think football hasn't even really announced any preseason games yet. They canceled the Hall of Fame game and we're already almost in mid-July. So football is it's so funny that when the pandemic started, football was acting like there was no pandemic. And now when we get into mid-July, football looks like one of the most uncertain ones. So right. the answer is no, I, I don't think they're going to be playing. I don't see how it can happen. Well, we figured that the NFL had time to get this right. As anybody can tell you about a deadline, uh, having more time doesn't ever mean you're going to get it right more in advance of the deadline. No, work expands to time allotted. If you've got 20 minutes to do something, it takes 20 minutes. If you've got six months to do it, it takes six months, <laughs> right? Yep. Now, here's a story in the news that I really don't think has gotten enough attention, which is in Spain, they did a study on COVID-19 and antibodies, and they found that of their population – only 5% had the antibodies. And what they were saying there is basically the idea of herd immunity. It doesn't seem like this virus is really going to contribute to that in the way that people wantonly throw the term around. That's right. We have no real reason to believe that this is the chicken pox, which is to say the idea that as long as I got it once, I can't get it again. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem to be the way that this virus is operating, because you've seen some people who have raised the question as to whether or not some of these schools that have all these positive tests, whether it's good for them, because, all right, our guys have it now. Now we don't have to worry. That doesn't seem to be how this virus works. And there's reason to believe that that second time you get it might be worse than the first. If you got reason to believe that the first time you get it saves you from the second and we know that it doesn't save you from the second, then what do we have? Like all of this is happening. And so these schools, once one person gets it, it seems like everybody's going to have it before too long. And there is literally no benefit from having it right That's now. Correct. It appears to be like, I just don't see how in the world that they'll ever be able to do this. The Ivy league has already said that they're going to push all their sports from the fall to the spring, which tells me everybody else is eventually going to wind up having to do the same thing because nobody can have somebody die on their watch. No, no doubt. And remember, when we were talking about this, when it first started, we needed benchmarks, right? You needed to know something. What do you know that's going to push forward to give you confidence to have a plan? Let me ask you this. What has happened that makes you feel any more comfortable about moving forward now than you did on March 6th? Oh, nothing. 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 And during that period, I remember I was on the phone with some tennis people when they canceled Indian Wells. And one of the guys immediately told me that this is a massive overreaction. And then, of course, the NBA stopped the next day. And then I think right around that same time, either the same day, or the day before, Tom Hanks announced he and his wife had it in Australia. And there was a delicate conversation being had there about whether or not you want to be 
do you want to look like you care about health or do you want to look like you care about money? Do you want to run the risk of looking like the cautious one or do you want to run the risk of looking like the callous one? And right now, caution has lost to callousness. And I think caution is coming back. It has to come back at some point because right now, everything that we're looking at, there is no indications that we have more education or more information that puts you in a positive direction than we did before. You could make an argument that, okay, we're five months closer to a vaccine, maybe, <laughs> but I don't see anything that makes me look at it and say, okay, well, at least we know this. So we've got a pathway to move forward. I don't see it. Yeah. Now, like, and let's say, especially with college, right? Let's say they go ahead and play or this keeps going as it does. Mm. And somebody makes the call and decision and they say to themselves, all right, somebody's going to die. Like I saw uh, Dennis Dodds at CBS Sports talk to somebody who had run the data, a professor at the University of Illinois to run the data. And the one thing he said unequivocally is someone's going to die. Yeah. Now, if you are the coach, before we even get to like the university president or anything else, you are the coach of a football team and a player dies from COVID. Your season is over. Season's over. Your career's over. Well, even if your career's not over, I think your career can survive because everybody's going to kind of understand what the situation is. But your season is over because there's no way you can get them kids back. Like, can you imagine being 18 years old and your partner just died of this? And we still got to come out here. They going to test me and then we going to come out here and play football. Or your man's is like laid up in the hospital real bad. Like guys of that age range, like football is notorious for people suffering these catastrophic injuries in practice. And then all we do is step over and go to the other side and keep on going. You're not going to be able to pull that off in this case, I don't no. think. Like as soon as one player gets really sick on any team, that team, even if they keep playing, your season is over. Well, look at Jake and Amanda Dickman from the Oakland A's. You see the statement they put out, and they're like, okay, so if somebody gets sick or someone dies in this, are we going to play some ESPN montage and then go back and play ball? I mean, these are real things. I mean, this is – I think that this is one of the things that bothers me about this, is that this idea, why are we having such a callous conversation about this? Especially when you talk to individual people, they're not leaving their houses. I mean, unless, obviously, when you go down to Florida and Texas, but around here – in, in Massachusetts, where I live, people are wearing hazmat suits to go grocery shopping, right? So they're taking care of their health, but they feel very cavalier about the health of a professional athlete. And I ask the question, why? And I think it's this overestimation, once again, of money, because they're rich. Well, you know what? Money is supposed to give you more freedom to make better decisions, to make more decisions. You're not essential. You see in some of these baseball players and basketball players opt out. Why? Because they can afford to opt out. Do you want to be away from your family for three months? Do you want to be in some bubble? You're not even sure what's going to... Usually you do these decisions, these work decisions out of economic necessity. And so this idea that the players are somehow obligated or that we're just okay with them starting, they actually have more leverage than most of us because a lot of them need the money less than we do. But I also think that people are operating on the premise that they're in such good shape. Look at the age and look at the percentages. Well, what's really funny about percentages is, is that percentages sound good until you talk about the actual numbers. Well, only 2%. Well, 2% comes out to like millions of people, depending on how big your sample is. Right. And I was talking to Art Howe about this, the manager of the A's. And obviously, Art was a world-class athlete, but he's, he's, he's older now and he's in the COVID bullseye. He had it. He was in the ICU. And he was telling me about what this virus did to him and losing his taste buds and losing a lot of his skills and everything else. And he was like, you don't really want this. And so the idea that, okay, well, you're 19 years old, you're 25 years old, you can handle it. You still have no idea about what the long-term effect, okay, okay, it doesn't kill you. Well, that's great. <laughs> what about the rest yeah, of it? What a low bar. <laughs> what a low bar. Hey, you're going to live. <laughs> right? That is the one that has gotten me in this is just, it's you're not going to die. You know what I could have said that about <laughs> polio, <laughs> right? True. Like, th right? Like, th like, think about that. Like, I didn't. I mean, and I need to look this up because I don't know that much about polio to be perfectly honest, right? But I feel like a whole lot of people survive polio, and one person I could think of that survived polio was in a wheelchair from in a it. Wheelchair. It's called exactly right. And was the president right? Yeah. It's true. And and that's what I mean about this idea of, and it goes back to this level of selfishness that we're not really great citizens. What we're really saying is I'm ready to watch football. 
And so I'm going to need you to start playing some football because I'm ready to watch it. And because you got a bunch of money, and I think there's the other piece of this too. It said, okay, because you got a bunch of money, if you get sick, you'll get pretty good care, right? Yes. So whatever happens to you is going to be better than whatever happens to me because of your resources. And when you think about it, that's a hell of a way to look at something. The, yeah, I just, I mean, it's just all of it. I just look at it and I'm just like, I, just, I can't see how we're going to find a way to do this. And don't let one of them old men get sick. You know, like one of these coaches, something yeah. winds up happening to them. But see, the problem is, of course, with uh, professional sports is the players have a much different incentive to come. Like, this is why I'm shocked by the college players coming back. Y'all ain't getting paid no money. That's I understand right. the idea that the players, especially in the sports with caps, are looking at this like, okay, we got to build this revenue pie up because revenue pie is what determines who gets paid and how. Drew Rosenhaus made a very good point, though. That he's like, look, the money's about to jump in 2022, 23, 24 because of the television deals kicking in. So you're in a position where this cap shouldn't have to take a nosedive for 2021 just because of the revenues being down for 2020. We can figure out a mechanism to smooth that out. And I think they're really going to need to do that because otherwise the pressure on a lot of these players to come back and play is much bigger financially, especially in football because those cats, like a lot of football players are rich. All football players are not rich. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And a lot of those guys spend exactly what they get. <laughs> it's like Chris Rock thing, the difference between rich and, and wealth. And also, what does it matter if you have $20 million if you've spent $22 million? Right. So it is an interesting sort of dynamic about what this does to the individual personal finances of the athletes. But I still think that at the end of the day, what we're really talking about is assuming and condoning levels of risk that we ourselves are not willing to take. Yes. That's what strikes me. That's what this whole thing sort of strikes me as. And every time you talk to players at some point, why y'all doing this? It's what they do. They're professionals. I mean, I'm glad that some of these early narratives have sort of disappeared. Like, well, if the military can go out and the soldiers can go out and the nurses can go out, then how come the ball players? Because one is essential and one is not essential. That's why. Well, also, you said they heroes. <laughs> <laughs> these are basketball players that's right you know like that's the one thing about it is if you're going to attach the hero narrative to people you can't then expect everybody else to do the same by the same token if you attach the hero narrative to those people you then can't let it slide when they act like everybody else or say that everybody else would have done the same thing that is i do think where we get on this and like i think it's been good to see in the nba in those places guys just being like nah man i ain't going well, and it's funny. It's like it's interesting to me because I just finished a story on Bruce Maxwell, the baseball player who took a knee and everything that happened to him afterwards, essentially being out of the game. He now lives in Mexico and plays in the Mexican League. But the mobilization of the Players Alliance, this group of black players who are now trying to decide what their response is going to be after, you know, black players have been so quiet in baseball for decades that the original communications was of a you know a black group chat from all the black players about COVID. That's how they all started communicating in the first place. Was that they had this group chat talking about okay, what are the health implications? You know, obviously when George Floyd was killed, the conversations in that group chat turned to this. But originally they were all talking about wait a minute, what's the right thing for us to do health wise? Let's take a moment to appreciate the fact that all the black dudes in baseball can be on one group chat. <laughs> <laughs> and and have it not top a hundred people. <laughs> you ain't even got you ain't even got to mute it, right? right? You, you don't have right. to put it on do not disturb because it's blowing up your situation all the time. You can have a Zoom chat with every black player in baseball and have it be on one screen. Yep, yeah, that's that is a damn shame. <laughs> that is that is literally it. But nobody's going to look out for them but themselves. That's right. That's it. Those are the only people that are going to do it. I can't imagine how shook some of these managers have to be. Well, and on top of that, what is going to happen when you're looking at the backlash? You know there's going to be a backlash, right? We know there's going to be some form of backlash. So for all the talk about being responsible and caring about safety and safety first and everything else, what's going to be the backlash to the guys who decide not to play and then the league plays, or suppose they finish a season, they lose, they could have used you, and now management and your teammates are like, I mean, I know you did what you had to do, man, but we could have used you, man, and we lost because you weren't there, man. And, and, and don't tell me those conversations aren't going to take place because they are. 
because at the end of the day, a championship's a championship, right? right. I mean, if you play the 60 game baseball season and crown a champion at the end, that's your champion, right? So, and if you lose, if you're the Dodgers, are you really going to say, yeah, we lost game seven, but it's cool that David Price wasn't there. We respect that. I mean, I hope so, because you respect his choice and you go with what you've got. But when you really start talking about it on the real, especially because we know there are several, several, several factions of people out there, as I think we saw with Jim Harbaugh, who was taking the position that, hey, man, it's just a fact of life right now. And we just got a deal. We got to start doing that hard hat, tough guy stuff. There's going to be some reaction, some negative reaction to some of these guys who made the decision not to play. And especially as you were talking about before, come contract time, a year from now, 18 months from now, we're going to be talking about players who were like, yeah, I opted out two years ago and I didn't get another call. I didn't get another offer. There's going to be some ripple effect to the decisions that are being made right now. You can bet that. (laughs) 2020 bad (laughs) right and especially right if you got all right if you're david price you signed a 217 million dollar contract you can forego 11 million dollars and okay but let's suppose you're a guy with one year left on your deal so you don't really have that economic sort of cushion you know you're not insulated because now our organization's gonna say i don't know can't really be counted on and never say it out loud but make the decisions that they're gonna make you know when they keep the quiet part quiet Now, you wrote a story about Bruce Maxwell. Uh, you mentioned him briefly, who was the one baseball player to take a knee during the game and then everything that happened subsequent to that and what came from it. Could you just uh, get a people a little bit about that? Well, Bruce Maxwell took a knee for the final nine games of the 2017 season, catcher for the Oakland A's. And what ended up happening with him was an incredibly crazy story. Immediately started getting death threats immediately was not, you know, was persona non grata in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways that was really interesting was that he had no support from the players and then had no support from the black players. And not only did he not have uh, any support from the black players, but a lot of the players assumed here was a guy who was just sort of grandstanding. He wasn't a real activist. He wasn't real about it. He was just trying to draw attention to himself. And the strain of all this really started to break him. and. And, and, and you know, Bruce had some issues with substance abuse anyway in terms of alcohol and everything else and the stress and add it all up. Obviously, I think people may remember he, in October 2017, had a delivery. And uh, when the takeout person brought his, you know, brought his food, he had his gun on him. And she said he pointed the gun at her. Obviously, cops come. And the rest of it goes downhill from there. He ends up having a bad 2018 season, gets released, and now nobody touches him. And he's in the Mexican League right now. And so now that everything is happening, and now we're looking at the you know, the, the post-George Floyd America, all of a sudden, even baseball players are now talking about the need to get involved in the Chicago Cubs are talking about Black Lives Matter and the Mets are talking about Black Lives Matter. And here's Bruce Maxwell saying, wait a minute, where was all this support two years ago? Where was this when I had my issues? And the story now is really all about these black players. And when you think about it from a sports standpoint, we've had LeBron, we've had Malcolm Jenkins, we've had Colin Kaepernick, we've had guys talk, but we haven't heard from baseball players on this at all. So suddenly that you have this movement of baseball players who are affected by George Floyd And now, on the other hand, you've got Bruce Maxwell, who is in exile in Mexico, saying, where was all this support when I was out there by myself? Nobody had my back. And now you guys all want credit for talking about the issues of race that you've dealt with. And now you want credit because it's safe to come out and play. And Bruce Maxwell is not having any of that. And so it's been one of those rare, rare moments where African-American baseball players are talking about what it is to be black in baseball. And you start looking at those numbers, you've got 68 black players in the entire game on opening day in 2019. And it's been this really interesting sort of revelation where the players are calling Maxwell and saying, hey man, we should have been there for you, but we weren't. And it's been real interesting because 
the black player in baseball does not have the LeBron James protection where you've got an 80% black league and you're the most recognizable athlete in the world and all that stuff. I mean, these guys are scared. These guys are scared for their careers. And so there's a reckoning taking place with these guys about where they fit in all this movement. Yeah, like I'm wondering what clubhouses are going to look like about this matter because, I mean, baseball players are not the most liberal bunch. (laughs) To be kind. Baseball's a Republican sport. I mean, baseball, when you walk in that clubhouse and anybody who's covered a baseball clubhouse, you know you got, you want to talk about clicks. You walk into a baseball clubhouse, you've got the white redneck dudes in that corner. You've got the couple of Asian players in that corner. You've got the one black player over in that wild corner over there. And then you got the Latino players all speaking Spanish to each other. There are very few guys that um, my boy Sean Dunstan used to call the, the bridge guys, guys who could bridge the different cliques. And so when you walk in there with the black participation in the game now being down around 7%, that's essentially one per team. It may be a couple teams like the Yankees had three players. The Red Sox had David Price, Mookie Betts, and Jackie Bradley Jr. And so some of those teams have had a couple. It was interesting when you had the Red Sox and Yankees play each other. I think at one point they had nine of the 68 players on the field at once. Um, at least in the the dugouts. And so it's a really isolating place. It's not the NBA. It's not the NFL. And when you walk into that baseball culture, you are immediately catapulted into uh, a very, very different culture. The difference between basketball, football, soccer, and those sports is that those sports have historically adapted to the people who play it. When you play baseball, baseball makes you adapt to it, which is why you've got all these ridiculous battles about throwing at guys and bat flips and the whole thing. Baseball makes you adapt to what its rules are and its customs are. And it's never really adapted to black culture or Latino culture or, or Asian culture. Well, like the, the clicks you talk about in the clubhouse, baseball has the great segregator, which is language. That's language right. is a bigger segregator. And if I learned anything in Miami, it is language is the great segregator. And so you start there and you also wind up with The way you talk about the black players kind of being afraid of their careers for saying something, that's like everyday life for the Latin dudes, it seems like, right? Especially the ones who are not excellent, like the ones who are just pretty good. Yeah. And especially because those guys, you would think that because their numbers have risen so much that that would translate into power and it hasn't. It's translated into a lot of Latino players, but it has not translated into having a Latino constituency block that everybody had to deal with. because. They've got that trump card that they're hanging over everybody's head, which is we could send you back. You might have some visa problems or where or because we are so ubiquitous down there, we can replace you because there's no draft. The Latinos players and you know the Dominican Republic of Venezuela, they're not subject to the draft. Then we could sign 50 of you for one of your salaries. So the economic pressures that are on those players to be quiet is enormous. Well, we also saw one place, though, where like there was a measure of Latino power And it turned into a bit of a disaster. And that is the Omar Minaya era with the New York Mets. And Mm -hmm. the disaster just being the resentment that the clubhouse developed toward everything and everybody. Now, granted, it's the Mets. It would have happened one way or another. (laughs) But still. Yeah, no doubt. And so that is the whole thing about how do you bridge those gaps? And especially because, like I said, about baseball culture. Basketball culture adapts. The game, there was a time when we were kids, when I was a kid growing up, I mean, white coaches always used to tell you none of that French pastry, you know, none of none of that. You know, they didn't want you to do any of that stuff. Any anything considered the playground game, the street game. They didn't even want you. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when switching hands by putting the ball between your legs was considered way too much hot dogging. Right. But now basketball has adapted to the people who play the game. That's it. People don't even blink now when basketball players play the, the game the way they play it. It's not true with baseball. Baseball is not like that. So absolutely, there's always a backlash when it comes to baseball about playing the game right. And Ian Desmond said it right on his Instagram post. Essentially, these are baseball is played by white rules. Baseball is played by the same rules before the game was integrated. This is how they expect you to behave. Now, I understand part of it. That baseball is not supposed to be an emotional sport. Because you play it 162 times, you can't get two up or two down. It's a game of failure. The, the, the culture of the game is different. The biggest cultural difference in the sport is the policing of it. Because unlike every other sport, the defense has the ball. So the defense gets to determine how you act because they'll throw the ball at you. right? If you don't, <laughs> if you don't act right, they'll throw the ball at you. 
So it's not like the other sports, but there's no question when you start crossing a certain threshold, the backlash in baseball is that, okay, I remember 1993 Giants. That team was about to move to Tampa and they don't. Peter McGowan comes in and saves the franchise. They sign Barry Bonds to a blockbuster six years at 42 or seven years, seven years at 42 million, right? Which was a ridiculous sum of money in 1992 in the winter. And then you've got Dusty as the manager, Barry Bonds as the best player, Bobby Bonds as the first base coach. And I remember Will Clark walking into that clubhouse saying, where the rednecks at? Essentially letting everybody know that things might be getting too black, too dark around here. You had Wendell Kim over there as a third base coach. And so baseball will remind you who runs the sport, especially at the clubhouse level. My probably least favorite baseball player of all time will clark will clark <laughs> will clark will clark. Will, Cl- will clark and lenny dykstra i think that's one and two yeah I, I can see that some similarities and sensibility there too and also clearly dykstra is a different category because that phillies team was as southern a team as you could have or it, uh, as white a team as you could have back then my least favorite baseball team of all time the 93 Phillies. Your boys in 93 in six games, right? They were too tired. I mean, tired. After, the, after the last great pennant race of all time, it was right. a little bit rough going to try to dial up seven with a bunch of dudes who don't throw hard. And didn't care. These guys, man. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I will still say, Bo, that is the great. It's the last great pennant race. No question about it. But I will still say when you talk about margins, the most amazing thing about that season was that the expansion Colorado Rockies did not win a game against the Braves. Nope. And that's how they won that division. Everything else was even. They went 14-0 and against the Rockies and won the division by a game. To be fair, the Rockies had the number one pick in the expansion draft and took a picture from the Braves, which is to say they actually made the Braves worse trying to make themselves better. So don't act like the Braves <laughs> didn't try to help them out. It's not the Braves' fault. I mean, the Giants could have beat them 14 hey, times. And the Giants didn't have to lose eight straight at home in September. So this is what, what an amazing what an amazing thing to happen, right? <laughs> Lose because they were up at the All Star break the strong. All-Star. The Braves right. traded for McGriff at the deadline the day the stadium caught on fire. That was weird, <laughs> and then they brought it back, and they brought it back, and and it wasn't like the Giants lost to great teams. I think they lost to it was Pittsburgh, St. Louis. And Chicago, and none of those teams were good teams at that time. Pittsburgh was the worst team in baseball. Ooh, that must have made Barry Bonds uh, yeah, furious. Yeah, and they it must have made Andy Van Slyke ecstatic. Ecstatic, exactly. Mr. Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, it's interesting. And it's like, I think that people don't appreciate what the black baseball players have to go through. When you're outnumbered, how do you strategize when you're outnumbered? And especially when you're talking about tactics, and it's interesting, like I'm interested in your thoughts about this, because one of the things that a lot of the black players have been asking me is strategically, how do you feel about kneeling? Does kneeling translate across the board as a gesture? That it's one thing to kneel when you're playing once a week. It's another thing when you play 162 times. Yes. And so what does that optic look like? Do you need to change up your tactics? How do you contribute to this movement? And I sort of found it funny when we were talking about the shaming of kneeling. So if you don't kneel, then you're not down. You're not as committed. You're you're afraid if you're if you're not willing to do that gesture. Uh, CC Sabathia said to me, "Hey, I didn't take a knee because that was Colin Kaepernick's gesture. I didn't feel like that was the right gesture for me." So there's also this internal question about what is considered the authentic protest. What is considered to be the authentic, uh, the appropriate. Uh, gesture and have it not be the compromise move, right? The compromise, let's make everybody comfortable move. Well, here's the thing. This whole question deviated in the beginning from what was the real question, which is not whether or not you should kneel, is do I have to stand for the national anthem? Because right. let us not forget that this started not because Kaepernick kneeled during the national anthem, because he sat by the water cooler. That's right. And, and I will say stand. again, mm-hmm. all the guys who sat by the water cooler didn't get any hell. Marshawn Lynch, didn't yep. get any hell. Michael Bennett Michael got Bennett. his own hell for different reasons, but it was not about the national anthem. And he sat by the water cooler through all with a bunch of dudes, by the way. So Nate Boyer over, did Nate Boyer did him wrong. Like, wildly didn't heal, right? Like it's the wildest thing that making this compromise with a veteran wound up putting Kaepernick 
it because uh, it, at first this wasn't a protest. It wasn't a gesture. It was I ain't standing for the national anthem. That's it right. wasn't about anybody else. It wasn't it about anything. Nothing to do with kneeling. Right. And so that's the thing now when people start talking about, well, do I need to kneel as a demonstration? The question you need to ask yourself is, do you want to stand for the national anthem? Because right. I feel like you don't have to if you don't want to, period. That's right. You also don't have to make a show of it if you don't want to. But what might actually be as much a thing as anything else, rather than these guys talking about kneeling, like in baseball, because they all tend to line up on the baseline during the national anthem. What if you just ain't there, right? Or, say, or everybody the comes up and line, you know, is lined up, and they say, "Now take off your hats for the national anthem." At which point, y'all take take some steps back. Yep. Or go like you don't even or go. So you can still stand if you want. You can take some steps back. Like there's all kinds of ways to do it. Because see, this is my thought: if all those guys are on the baseline, and then the black dudes decide to take a step back to make the point. Yeah, there's somebody that's going to make the argument. Well, this gives a, a, a the message of division. But I feel like they're just making it up when they say that. If you do that, all the people who are saying that you are being disrespectful to the flag, that argument goes out the window because you're still there, you're still stepping back. We're your being disrespectful still to the baseline. Right. But, <laughs> but that's the thing. That's the way that you whittle away at all the noise around the argument and get people to just tell on themselves about what it is. So that's my thing about the kneeling has been for a while. That's kind of expired. Yeah. It's almost become too ubiquitous. That's I right. mean, and with all due respect to Megan Rapino. When she kneeled at that game, it was almost kind of like, hey, guys, time to come up with something else. That's normally how we do <laughs> when we come up with something stylish and slick. That was the shark jumping moment. But except it wasn't because it was a big deal because she brought this into a whole new place and put a new face on it that made it seem like broader and universal in a way that I think was very positive. Like, I don't think she was being like a culture vulture necessarily, yeah. but it did tell you that, that this was real. you might need to come up with something else. No doubt. And actually, and I don't know if it's out or not yet, but I was watching a screening of the Tommy Smith documentary with arms drawn. And she's on there and she made a very interesting point. And she said the part about kneeling to her that she's been having a difficult time reckoning with is the fact that kneeling didn't hurt her. Right. She's like, kneeling raised my profile. Kneeling didn't hurt me. If anything, kneeling brought more attention to me and it put me in a position of leadership. People look at me, they look to me now. Whereas when you look at what had happened to the black people who kneel, very different reaction. I thought it was interesting of her to be mindful of that. Yeah, I was going to say, I respect the fact that she peeped game on that. That's right. Because right. I think something that very often happens, I know at different points I've had to be careful about this when I've spoken on matters of gender, is that when you're a person who's coming from, you know, outside of the group to speak as an ally, as opposed to the term that you That's use, right. but you have a certain measure of privilege that those people don't have, it's really easy to fall in love with the sound of your own voice. That's and right. And you are this great person that's coming to do something for these other people. So I greatly appreciate the fact that she recognized, like, wait a minute, so I'm going to get paid off of this while mm -hmm. these people are going and get destroyed. That's right. 100%. And that spells out what the problem is. To recognize that what you're doing, the reaction is not going to be the same no matter what you do. Because what that tells you is, is that the issue is never the gesture in the first place. The issue is you. I mean, we talk about this all the time in terms of publishing and, and writing and everything else. It's one thing for you and for me to write about race. If a white person wrote the exact same stuff we wrote, the reaction would be different. Their mail would be different. The response would be different. The way that people would react to the story would be different. It's so, so much of it is actually the messenger as well. And to be cognizant of that gets closer to that truth and reconciliation that you're talking about, where it's like, okay, can we have some real talk here? You know, can we actually talk about this? Right. And that's how you actually get somewhere. I want to change gears just a little bit because it's a story that's out. Have you seen this? Uh, McCure McCare. This is going to be weird because it's not Thon Maker. It's actually Thon McCare. But we've been saying Thon Maker for so long. Mm -hmm. So it's like I kind of need to say Maker. <laughs> and right? he's part of the, the McCare Maker clan, right? Yeah, yeah. So the young man's going to Howard. Did an interview on uh, the ESPN Daily podcast uh, with Pablo Torre. You might want to check out. And he's going to Howard. This is a big thing because he's like a top 20 recruit and he's going to Howard. I am trying to get as excited about this as everybody else. But, and I can't do it. <laughs> I was going to say, there's a butt attached to this. Why are you not excited about this? Um, there's a couple of reasons why I'm not excited about it. Number one, and this isn't like, I don't know if it's fair to say I'm not excited because of this, but I do think people need to understand this isn't James Wiseman. 
All right, this isn't Zion Williamson. This isn't that guy in that class. He's a five-star recruit. But what it means to be a five-star recruit in basketball, they're like 35 stars every year. There's a giant gap between one and 30. I was going to say, that's the point. Yeah, and McCare is kind of like in the like late teens, early 20s, if I'm not mistaken, on this one. like If he were try to go into the draft this year, I think ESPN had him as the number 75 prospect. He is not a must-see player. 75 prospect? He's not even in the draft. The draft's only two exactly. rounds. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. He's, He's not, not a guy that drafted. He- yeah, he's not a guy that you got to see, right? Like the idea, like, oh, man, now the TV cameras are going to come. TV cameras weren't going to come for him wherever he went. They were going to be there already. Like, I don't think he's that caliber of player. Now, maybe it looks different because he'll be playing against, you know, playing against the MIAC. He can dominate. But before they play against the MIAC, he's going to be out here playing against some Division One schools on the road where his team is getting beat by 30, right? Yep. Now, if this leads to, like, I, I think, and this is the way I put it on this, I think this would have been a bigger deal if Howard had gotten – Three three star prospects. Yep. Than Better getting team. one five star. Right, right, yeah. right. Like we could like we could make an operation, you could develop them, whatever it is. I think that would be an indicator of more of a sea change mm-hmm. than the idea this one guy went. The other thing is we gotta think about why is it that he went to Howard and Kenny Blank need a head coach there, I'm sure, did a great job in recruiting him. But this is college basketball, right? McCare's last two schools were what? UCLA and Howard. What did those two schools have in common? Under Armour contracts. Who did Kenny Blayton used to work for? Mm-hmm. Under Armour. This is actually business as usual. It just so happens that the business as usual, the guy that used to work for Under Armour, now coaches at Howard. It actually right? includes, yes. And the other part, and I think this is important, he's still going to Howard to not get paid. Also. Right? Like, like, like just because it's black people that are doing the exploiting doesn't mean the exploiting is not going down here. So I think it's good if that's what he wants to do and that makes him happy. That is what he should have done. I think he'll have a wonderful time while he's at Howard. He might be at Howard for a couple years. Like, I don't think he's necessarily a one and done guy. So I think it's cool on that level. But I saw all the, yeah, we got one. And I'm like, yeah, but what, what that, what's that going to do? And what's it mean? Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And it agreed with all the above. Absolutely. And especially the Under Armour business part of it. And adding that part to it really makes it business as usual and makes it dirty business as usual. Right. It just adds to the level of exploitation that we've been talking about when it comes to college sports in the first place. Here's the other area that I was thinking about. I was thinking about romance. That's where my mind goes when I think about this story. And when I think about romance, I think about it very similarly to people who have nostalgia for the Negro Leagues. When they think about that, there is a feeling of black empowerment here, that this movement to Howard is also part of of a larger awakening of consciousness here, that we're starting to do something black owned. There's some form of black empowerment here, that this is a signal, that this is a symbolic gesture in outside of the business and everything else. It's a symbolic gesture that suggests that black people are trying to take care of our own because there has been this conversation about, well, what if all the black talent went to HBCUs and and kept it close again like they used to before integration. And that that would force everyone in this money train to treat us differently, to treat those athletes differently. And so there's a romantic element here that suggests that there's a larger game taking place. And this is the first piece in that chess game. I'm not sure I see it. And I'm not sure I see it for a couple of reasons. One is that romance is usually illusionary in the first place. It can be illusory. But the other part of it, too, is that if you're thinking about comp and to be a great player and all these things, there's a massive, massive movement that's got to take place to actually enrich those athletes. Right. So if you're going there to be a great player, are you going to get the level of comp that you need? Is anyone going to follow you? Is there some method here if we're really talking about levels of black empowerment where there's a pathway to this? Or does this simply feel like crumbs for a starving people again, that we need so many things that we're placing far more emphasis on this transaction than we need to? I also think that people want to believe that capitalism goes save you from racism, and that ain't really how it works, right? Also true. Like, right? like have you have you heard me make my um, UAB example <laughs> as to why it is that uh, this ain't going to go the way people think it will? Let's hear it. All right, so people, basically the argument is made is like, yo, but if all the black players go to HBCUs, then they got to bring the cameras. They're going to have to come televise these games. No, they don't. No, no they, they don't. don't. So let's say, for example, let's say it's in football. Somehow, some way, 
Alabama State, which is an HBCU in Montgomery. Alabama State got the number one recruiting class in America. Let's just imagine a circumstance where this could happen. <laughs> Let me tell you why you can't even imagine a circumstance where this would happen. After the 2006 season, the University of Alabama at Birmingham wanted to hire Jimbo Fisher as its head coach. At the same time, Alabama had a coaching opening. University of Alabama, their head coaching job was open, and they were having a difficult time getting somebody to take the job. Ultimately, they got Nick Saban to take the job, but they were having a difficult time. The state of Alabama would not approve Jimbo Fisher's contract. I can't remember if it was like the state legislature or if it was just the 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 board over the University of Alabama system. They would not go for Jimbo Fisher's contract. There have been a few theories, a couple theories as to why that was the case. The two of them that are most prevalent are A, they didn't want Jimbo to have that job because they wanted Jimbo to be Saban's offensive coordinator when he took over at Alabama. I don't know how well the timing works out on that, but that's one thought people have. But thought number two is they would not approve that contract because there was a danger that UAB was hiring a better coach than Alabama had, and Alabama wasn't going for it. And I say that to say, if they will do that to UAB, <laughs> what do you think they <laughs> will do, do to more Alabama? House. Exactly. They got it back, but the state tried to shut down the whole damn program at <laughs> Alabama Birmingham. And when they wanted to start a program at Alabama Birmingham, Bear Bryant was vehemently opposed to it. And his thing was, they don't need a football team. They got us. Yeah, that's right. And you think that if Alabama State all of a sudden starts killing it, that they just going to be like, oh, fair and square. I guess we got to ride along. Like, what American history have you been paying attention to to make you believe that their response is going to be, good job, African American? <laughs> good to see you decided to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and yeah. take advantage of all that's been offered to you. No doubt. And I think you're right. I mean, there are wheels within wheels, and there always are. And there always will be. And I think that. That is another part of this, and I don't want to be cynical about it because I don't know how the wheels move within the state of Alabama, but I have an idea, right? <laughs> we have an idea of how it works. And also, I think to your point of exploitation having no color, like what difference does it make? 100%. 100%. I mean, if you're really going to battle for something, you got a moment in time right now with amateurism on its knees to go for the knockout blow, right? Because one of the things that the Ivies are doing seems to me they're also trying to send a message to all the other universities going, if you care about your amateurism, you might want to follow our lead. Because how are you going to put college players in the field when the classrooms are closed and the campuses are closed? Then they suddenly become essential workers, which workers are employees. And if you begin to extrapolate this whole thing out, if you tease it out, it's all got to go right? Eventually it's got to go. So it's no different in some ways than when you were talking about the Washington football team and the logo and the whole thing and the nickname and all of it. At some point, there's just too much water in the tidal wave. At some point, what do they say? The dam bursts, right? At some point, you've got to reckon with this. And I still have taken the, made the argument, and I hold on to it, that anyone who talks about the speed in which all this is happening, I'm like, you know, the speed is slow. There's nothing happening right now that would make you feel like this is happening quickly. That nickname has been there since 1933. Yo, I had people <laughs> telling me, and and I and, and like it's very kind of you to say this. Those who did, I had people telling me like, "Yo, you really jumped that discussion off about the Cleveland Indians with that T-shirt." If I jumped the discussion off with the T-shirt, why they make the T-shirt in the first place? Because the discussion had already been going on for decades. They didn't custom make that T-shirt for you? <laughs> Dope. I think people really believe that. Everybody hit me up like, yo. Where can I get one of them? Not where can I get it. I need to get one of them from you. <laughs> like, I, I appreciate, I'm flattered by the idea that they think I'm capable of doing something like that. But they thought I'd come up with the whole thing. No, man. Like, and that's what I'm talking about, not falling in love with the sound of your own voice. Native people have been behind that they've been the ones that's making the push they the that's ones that's right. showing up to the stadiums and dealing with the abuse i wore a damn t-shirt on television ain't mm -hmm. nothing close to being similar about those two things like but to get here it all happened at once at the end well we do the same thing with ball players right we're giving colin kaepernick and we're giving the players credit it's the people who are in the street yep think about it even if you go back to oscar grant right when he got killed in oakland which by the way i think the anniversary is today no it was yesterday, yesterday rather yesterday. The decision. Mm -hmm. right 
So when you're talking about all the, the blocking traffic and, and, and filling up the BART stations and being in the street in Ferguson, the players are reacting to that. They didn't go out there first and then all the people like, yeah, let's go, right? St. Louis Rams went out there with the hands up, don't shoot gesture. Let's go block traffic. It's the other way around. It's always the other way around. But we keep falling in love with these gestures and we keep falling in love with celebrity. And we need to tie celebrity to give celebrity an importance that it doesn't always deserve. That's the reason why these narratives take place. And if you look at it that way, they're wholly inaccurate from the start. We are justifying our own existence and craft. <laughs> like, that's a lot of it. That's a lot of it. But Howard Bryant, check him out. Check out his book, Full Dissidents. Also check out his book, The Heritage. Check him out at ESPN the Magazine, his new story on Bruce Maxwell. Check out the story he did on Michael Jordan at the last dance. Check the man out. The man should be checked out. He, you live in that same life as me these days. Our phones stay blowing up these days, boy. <laughs> Busy. Hey, you know what, though? Look at it this way. If you can't find something to write about now, you're in the wrong business. <laughs> this ain't for you. <laughs> this ain't for you. This ain't for you. But ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us on The Right Time. We do this thing a couple times a week. My man Gabe Bassane handles everything behind the scenes. Thank you, sir. Remember, subscribe to The Right Time. Rate us, review us. Give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to think you are a hater. And we'll talk to you guys in a couple of days. Take it easy. Thanks for checking out The Right Time with Bomani Jones Podcast. You can listen or subscribe on the ESPN app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. The Right Time with Bomani Jones.